just how fragile is peace in Bosnia? A quarter of a century after the Dayton Accords ended the bloodiest conflict in Europe since the Second World War. Well, you know, a generation may well have grown up without seeing bloodshed, but ethnic tensions still very much exist. Did a deal to end the fighting actually end anything in the long term? Hello and welcome from me, David Foster. It is such a complicated picture that it's no surprise that many view Dayton as a poor agreement. And rather than coming closer, there's increasing talk that one of the regions that came out of the deal will push for independence. In 1995, the Dayton peace agreement ended the Bosnian war that had cost about 200,000 lives. The peace deal divided Bosnia into two political entities, Republika Srpska and the Federation, shared by Bosniak Muslims and Croats. While the end of the war brought relief for Bosnians, the agreement was widely viewed as legitimizing war crimes, mass killings and ethnic cleansing. Today, tensions between Bosnia's two autonomous regions remain. Bosnian Serb leaders have talked about splitting away from the country. And almost five years after Bosnia applied for EU membership, accession talks remain a distant prospect. Bosnia's future is still being shaped by the Dayton Accords of 25 years ago. But have they left a legacy of peace or political problems? I'm very glad to say that we can welcome to this roundtable out of Hamburg, Marika Jolai, head of the Conflict and Security Cluster at the European Centre for Minority Issues. In Sarajevo, we have Reuf Bairovic, co-chair of the US-EU Alliance, former Bosnian government minister, and also in Sarajevo, Marko Attila Ho, a historian who teaches at the Sarajevo School of Science and Technology. Welcome to each and every one of you. Um, Rov, let me come to you first of all. Uh, you are a Bosniak, a Bosnian Muslim. Can we start from the premise that the Dayton Accords were necessary because they stopped many more deaths? Well, the Dayton Accords is the result of specific circumstances uh, of 1995 which is that uh, the U.S. presidential election campaign was just kicking off, and uh, CNN and other news channels were covering the Bosnian war extensively, basically by the hour. Uh, the publics in the West, especially the U.S., did not want to see those images on television. So the Americans really got uh, decisive and decided to end the conflict. And the conflict really ended at the moment where the, when the Bosnian army was uh, winning the war. Uh, after having been uh, subjected to... Uh, I hate to foreshorten your history pardon. lesson here, but I, I want to get a specific answer to the question. Dayton was needed because it stopped the killing. Dayton did not uh, necessarily stop the killing. The killing was stopped by the force used by NATO uh, allies. It wasn't Dayton. It was the actual uh, uh, force. It was military force that stopped the killing. You know, the negotiations are a direct result of what happened uh, because of the usage of NATO airplanes. But you say the, the Bosnian army was winning. Therefore, do you think it should have continued the conflict? Well, that's the mother of all questions. I mean, it depends on who you ask. Uh, it certainly would have been a more just outcome had the Bosnian army been allowed to win the war. Uh, but the fact, uh, fact is that 25 years later, we are where we are because of a decision made by key Western officials at the time to stop the war at this particular moment in time. Marika, what would have happened if the war had continued, if there hadn't been a date? I think the consequences would have been really drastic, uh, much more than they're now. Um, more than 100,000 people died in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Two, two million, more than two million were displaced. Um, most of the country's inf infrastructure was destroyed. Um, the social fabric of the society was broken down completely. Um, so I think uh, what would have happened is the same, just much worse. More deaths, more destruction, more displaced. Um, and I hate to even think about some final outcome for another or two years of fighting. 
But Reuf is saying the Bosnian army was in the ascendancy and that Dayton gave Serbia greater powers than it would other have had, leading eventually to the establishment of Republika Srpska. Therefore, the Dayton Accord suited Serbia much more than the Bosnians. Uh, at that point in time, possibly. I'm not, uh, I'm not a military analyst, you know, I'm a, an anthropologist and sociologist, so I can't uh, really discuss uh, competently military tactics and, and um, uh, military advances at the time. Uh, certainly, there is a level of unfairness uh, towards the Bosnian side in, in the Dayton Agreement. Um, and I think it, it did suit Serbia uh, for various reasons uh, to end the war there and then, not just um, not just uh, for for the mere profit, but I think there were uh, different internal reasons um, and uh, disagreements, if you like, be, be, between the Bosnian Serb uh, leaders and the Serbian leaderships, more specifically. Slobodan Milosevic, so all of that has to be taken mm. into account. It's not, Can you I know, bring it's in... not very simple. I, absolutely. Uh, it's an extremely complicated situation. But Marco, can I come to you and ask you to simplify this question? Did the Bosnians come out of it worse than the Serbians? Yes, I, I think they, they did. Essentially, um, as Rayo was saying, the Bosnian army was, was winning the war in 1995 when was called to it. And there was no need to be so generous in terms of the territory and constitutional provisions granted to the Serb entity, Republika Srpska. I mean, this was uh, a Serb nationalist faction that was on the verge of complete defeat. They would have conceded much more in return for peace. So you could have insisted on a much more centralized Bosnian state and a territorially smaller Serb entity, or perhaps even no, no real Serb entity at all, with much fewer competencies. Um, and yet, no... yet if there hadn't been Dayton, which perhaps was unfair to some extent on the Bosnians, there would have been many more deaths. No, I, I don't think so. I think the, um, you had to have a peace agreement, but it didn't have to be on those terms. There was no need for the peace agreement to concede a, a very large Serb entity with very large constitutional competencies. You could have simply, they would have simply conceded much more. So there was no need to give them as much as, as you did in return for peace. OK, so the agreement itself that was at stake not actually coming to some kind of peace deal. Let me ask you about the current situation. I know you believe it's precarious. Describe to us to what level you think it's dangerous. Well, we're um, now paying the price of this flawed, deeply flawed peace settlement because you have a Bosnian state that is dysfunctional, that cannot really function, and a very strong Republika Srpska Serb entity whose leadership wants to secede ideally and will and rejects Bosnian statehood and cooperation and reintegration. And that's a very explosive situation. So at some point in the future, in the near future, it's possible to imagine Republika Srpska making a bid for independence, which could be dangerous if it gets support from outside, from, from Serbia, from Russia, maybe from, even from Croatia. Um, so this is all on the cards. I and mean, a lot depends on, on what happens, what the Western policy is. If Bosnia-Herzegovina is brought into NATO, that will make it much more difficult to partition the country and bring about the secession of the Republic of Srpska. And equally, if Serbia gains membership of the European Union, then Republic of Srpska might be in a stronger position to secede. Absolutely, yes. I mean, it's very difficult to um, force European Union members to exercise restraint or to curse them or discipline them in any way. So once Serbia joins, if Bosnia is still outside of NATO, a Serbia in the European Union will have very little re restraint on its behaviour. It's nothing to stop it then from pursuing a kind of renewed expansionist policy in the region, irredentist policy involving the partitioning of Bosnia. Ray, if you've described the Dayton Accords as the least worst of three possible options, what were the other two choices? Well, one was certainly partition. Uh, the other one was some sort of a soft partition, whereby the entities would uh, have the right to uh, join uh, neighboring states uh, after a year, two, three, four, depending on what the concrete proposal was. So uh, Dayton has many flaws, but one of the strong suits of Dayton is that it does not deny the basic fact that Bosnia became independent in 1992 
and that it decided because of the conflict, because of the aggression by neighboring states, to uh, rearrange its constitution. So Bosnia is the same state that joined uh, the UN in May of 1992. And this is the, the key issue uh, in terms of how the Serb side uh, sees Dayton. The Serb side wants to say that Dayton uh, was the moment, it was the moment that country uh, came about, which is precisely the opposite of what the actual uh, Dayton Peace Accord text says. So the text very clearly states that Bosnia, uh, the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina that joined the UN in 1992 has now become Bosnia and Herzegovina and is made up of two entities and, uh, you know, cantons and so on. So uh, yeah. that's- I, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to Marika, right? If, sorry, I'm not, I don't mean to cut you off, but everybody has to have an equal amount of time uh, on, on this program. and. Regarding Republika Srpska and the raw deal that the Bosnians say they feel they have a possible secession, independence uh, for that republic, is that something that Serbia is still very keen on? A greater Serbia? I'm not entirely sure that uh, I would I would say that um, Serbia is keen on a greater Serbia or the current Serbian leadership, uh, but there are certainly. Uh, Two different issues. One issue is um, that the Serbian leadership likes to uh, maintain its leverage in the region uh, of the Western Balkans. And one way of doing so is by um, keeping the close ties and playing this political game um, with, the, uh, with the leadership of Republika Srpska. On the other hand, there are many connections business connections, if you want to call them that way, uh, some of them legal, but many more of them um, illegal, which tie certain persons in the Republika Srpska and uh, Serbia. So uh, networks, some call them criminal networks, which are very uh, closely tied together. Um, and it's not easy to break up this. So uh, we need to understand the relationship between Serbia and Republika Srpska in a broader sense uh, from yeah. uh, the side of politics, but also economics and everything that um, has been built so, in the past 25 years. Can we perhaps try and establish the relationship between Bosnia and Herzegovina um, and Republika Srpska? Many Bosnians not happy with the tripartite way of sharing power. Uh, you have the Croats, you have the, the Serbs in the Republic, you, you have the Bosniaks. Would it not perhaps be better for Bosnia to say goodbye to Republika Srpska, or, or do you see dangers in that? Well, it's, 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 it's impossible. It's like it's uh, like challenging, defying gravity. Republika Srpska cannot secede uh, because the territorial partition within the country is such that it is uh, simply unsustainable. Uh, Republika Srpska would have to then take over the Brčko district in the north of the country um, militarily, because as is right now, Republika Srpska is an entity which is non-contiguous. Uh, furthermore, it would be uh, hypothetically uh, the only country in the world with the border to land ratio, which would be uh, absurd. I mean, there's a reason countries don't have so, so much border uh, to, to, you know, to such small uh, square footage or square mileage or square kilometers of territory. Uh, it is something that is simply impossible. And the leadership in Serbia and the leadership in the Luka and the RS knows that Republika Srpska cannot, under any circumstance, become an independent state without an armed conflict. OK, um, I want to bring in right now what Paddy Ashdown, former high representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina, had to say in 2018. And he wondered, does this, the situation in the Balkans that existed then and perhaps now, does this lead to conflict? Probably no, but the international community is sleepwalking into an international disaster of major proportions. These times remind me of the 1930s. Everything is falling apart. The centre cannot hold. Marco, when it comes to his comparison with the 1930s, is he talking about sides that simply cannot agree on anything, uh, other countries with interests in other regions where perhaps they shouldn't have? Uh, he's presaging the start of the Second World War. He says no conflict, but I mean, crikey, what a tinderbox. 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think perhaps it's not quite as serious as the situation in the 1930s, but there are some parallels. I mean, we've seen uh, Russia just um, a couple of years ago formally annexing territory in Crimea that belongs to the neighboring state of Ukraine, a straightforward act of annexation which, which the international community has, has embraced. Um, Serbia is still pursuing in a kind of more, not quite so overtly, but nevertheless pursuing this kind of regional policy of uh, trying to maintain and extend its influence in the Republic of Srpska in, in Montenegro, in Kosovo, which is supposed to be independent states. Um, and the West seems to be in retreat with Brexit. I mean, you, you had Trump as a, a president of the United States who was kind of calling into question uh, the validity and usefulness of NATO. So there are all kinds of reasons for being quite worried. Um, I, I'm a bit optimistic now that you've, with Be Joe Biden becoming U.S. president, you'll have a kind of renewed U.S. commitment to to NATO and to Euro-Atlantic in institutions and integration that will actually help improve the situation. Uh, Marika, I wanted to ask you about um, something you said about you don't believe that there's a possibility or probability anyway of more conflict, but you are rather concerned about local tensions, which we would not like to see get out of control. So how, how do you diffuse those? Uh, I think there is no uh, there is no one recipe uh, for all for refusing tensions. And from my own work and my own research across Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, I found that different communities uh, operate differently. So you, even within Republika Srpska, you have um, some communities, villages or small towns uh, that operate well, and the other ones uh, where tensions or uneasy coexistence is very evident. Uh, so I would say definitely, um, so first of all, um, issues of understanding the local context, uh, respecting the rule of law, uh, taking into consideration um, challenges um, on the part of local officials uh, and addressing them accordingly and in a timely manner uh, and learning from uh, communities that uh, cooperate and coexist easily are yeah, all the but, ways uh, to, to go forward. But if you have puppet masters who want to manipulate those tensions for their own ends, no matter whether they are in the region or outside the region, how do you prevent things from escalating from the local level once more into the national, international level? Well, this, I mean, if we compare the situation to before, uh, the escalation, I think, first of all, People in Bosnia and Herzegovina, be it in Srpska or in, uh, in the Federation, are wary of another bloodshed. And I think uh, from what I uh, heard from them, it would be very difficult to push them so easily and to manipulate them so easily um, to pick up the arms and to kill each other again in the way they have um, 25 or 30 years ago. Well, that, that, uh, that sounds relatively optimistic. That does sound, I, that does sound a great deal better than I, I've always, been reading in the I'm always optimistic articles. about Bosnia, no matter what. So excuse me for that. <laughs> uh, Rayov, let me come to you. If Dayton was imperfect, what needs to be done now to, to make it better, uh, to cement the future of the region and prevent more conflict? Well, Republika Srpska needs to be abolished. Republika Srpska is the uh, result of genocide, and it was allowed to exist only because uh, of the specific political international context uh, in 1995. The international community has essentially allowed Republika Srpska to become uh, stronger and to have this uh, illusion that it can somehow become independent. This is a direct well, outcome. That's not going to happen. It's not going to be abolished. Uh, well, that we differ there. Now, how will that come about? Well, there are two ways uh, that Republika Srpska can be abolished. One is via a new international conference uh, that would be a follow-up to Dayton conference. Uh, the other one is over time, demographic changes will make it possible for the RS to be abolished. There is a procedure within 
the Bosnian constitution for changing of that constitution and the, no provision in there says that the entities and the cantons cannot be abolished or changed or uh, divided into uh, the Republika Srpska can be cantonized, for example. But, but you so, maintain you maintain that mainstream Europe does not want a majority Muslim nation in the center of the continent. Therefore, once again, I would say it is not going to happen that Republic of Serbs is going to disappear. Well, uh, if it was up to Europe uh, in the 90s, Bosnia would not have uh, survived. Uh, there's a famous quote in the book Clinton Tapes in which Bill Clinton is quoting what uh, I think it was Francois Mitterrand who told him that uh, what's happening in Bosnia is an ugly but natural restoration of Christian Europe. Uh, and that's more or less the policy of the EU in the last 25 years. Uh, there are numerous examples of where EU essentially decided to side with the uh, Belgrade and the Serb side in the region. Uh, the, uh, Serbia is the front runner in the international European integration process, which is, in my view, ridiculous considering how weak Serbia's democracy is right now. Uh, so. EU does not get to decide everything, but you're right. I think that there is a strong bias against Bosnia, Kosovo, certainly Albania, and I think the other three countries should also start so, realizing. So that I'm going to move on. I'm, I am going to move on. Uh, you say Republika Srpska should be abolished. You maintain that's going to be very difficult because the European Union doesn't want uh, to see a Muslim majority state Bosnia um, in the centre of Europe. So let me go to Marco and, and say, what do you think will happen? next? It's very difficult to predict. A lot will depend upon how um, international leaders respond, you know, what policies they, they, they decide to adopt in the immediate future. But my feeling is the most likely scenario is that you will have a sort of the West kind of bumbling along, sort of bumbling along without really changing the situation. And eventually you will have some kind of conflagration, perhaps an attempt at secession by Republika Srpska, or perhaps some other uh, crisis evolved in Chicago. We can't even predict where it could be. It could be in Montenegro, it could be over Kosovo again. Um, that sooner or later you will have a crisis erupting which will require then a more decisive uh, intervention by, by, by the Western powers. Um, and that will depend upon the sort of the, how sensibly they, they react to, to the situation. So we've seen in the early 1990s they reacted very badly, and it's perfectly possible to imagine them behaving equally badly and incompetently ag again. So is there enough goodwill in the region to prevent a generation which has grown up without any kind of warfare from experiencing in the future further bloodshed? No, I don't think that goodwill exists, unfortunately. I and mean, we've seen that after the Second World War, when we had quite a fair solution to the national question in Yugoslavia, comparatively so, uh, that when you had its Yugoslavia, which is upheld as a kind of model of coexistence, that that didn't prevent, uh, after sort of half a century, bloodshed and, and genocide and warfare from erupting. So in the present situation where you have this bitter unresolved conflict, this continued sort of ethnic polarization in Bosnia produced by the Dayton system, um, entrenched hostility, institutionalized uh, nationalism and segregation, um, th there's no reason to believe that the goodwill exists to prevent a new war or, okay. or a new genocide. Okay, I, I, I did sense some optimism on the panel. Uh, let, let's go back to the person I ascribed that to. Marika, you say a new peace is needed now. What will that look like? And I'm sorry, we don't have much time left. Uh, the new peace uh, has to differ to the one that was uh, for which the Dayton Agreement was built 25 years ago. And it has to take into account the developments in the country and in the region. Um, it has to uh, refer to democracy and to, to stress um, importance of democracy, the rule of law, um, the various uh, uh, sides of the EU accession process that uh, Bosnia is part of. Uh, it has to take into account uh, global changes, um, uh, young generation, which is very different to the one that was uh, young 25 yeah. years ago. And is is that generations. possible? Is that achievable with the current, geogra current geographical boundaries uh, as drawn up after Dayton, or will things inevitably change? I think it's geographical boundaries are one side of the story. Uh, 
political and social will uh, and international will for these uh, supporting these issues or for supporting new peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina are different issue. We I don't like analyzing the country through a single pathway, if you like. It's a complex situation and it has to be uh, analyzed in, um, in a complex way yeah. and it requires multi-layered solutions, not just one. It's not a question whether there is a border, just the question of whether there is a border or not. There is a question. I'm going to have to stop you. I really yeah. am going to have to stop you. Complicated it is. I hope we have done a little bit to throw some light on a very difficult issue. You three were much more fluent than I was at times. I blame it on a little bit of a cold that I have. But thank you for putting up with me. And thank you wherever you have to be watching this edition of Roundtable. We value your company. We'd love to have you back next time. But until then, from me, David Foster and the Roundtable team, goodbye. <laughs>